You know, it all begins in the mind. And today we're going to talk about some supernatural thoughts that have to be planted in your thinking if you're going to get on the trajectory that God wants you on for your life. Romans chapter 12, in fact, we parked on this verse a few weeks back. It says in verse 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but shift, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, what the writer is saying to you and me is that change in our lives isn't all about doing something different. Change in our lives is primarily about thinking something different. Thinking something different leads us always to doing something different. But for most of us, we start thinking, well, I need a new direction or I need to make a shift or I need to see a different result. And we immediately go to, well, what do I need to do to get that result? What do I need to do to make that change? What do I need to do to see that shift? And what Paul is saying is, before you can be transformed, and the word there is metamorphosis, if you know what that word is all about. If you want to go from being a caterpillar in a cocoon to a butterfly in the sky, it begins with the renewing of your mind. In other words, it's a picture like this today. You're a gardener and your mind is the garden. And you maybe are not responsible for every single thing that's been planted there. Maybe a person planted a thought there. For sure, the enemy has planted thoughts there. Maybe you planted some thoughts there. Maybe God planted some thoughts there. But in the garden of your mind, you are the gardener. You actually have the ability by the power of the Spirit of God in you to garden well and to cultivate what you think about. If you didn't have that ability and you didn't have that power and that wasn't possible for the believer, then God would have been setting us up for a colossal letdown in this text. But he said, it's possible for you to no longer be conformed to the pattern of this world. You, you don't have to have the outcome and result of every other person on planet Earth. You're in a different story and it is a victory story. And here's how you get there. You get there by renewing your mind. And yes, renewing your mind all through scripture is going to modify the way that you live, but you don't start by trying to change behavior. You start by trying to change what you think. And he says, it's renewing your mind. And as he unpacks this in scripture, it's renewing your mind to what God has to say about you. The scripture says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. In other words, whatever you're hosting in your garden, whatever you're giving shelter and sustenance to in your garden is ultimately going to give you the crop called your future. And today God is saying, I want you to win the battle of your mind. What's been planted there that needs to go? And what needs to be planted there so that in a season to come, you'll be the person that God is dreaming that you will be. Last week, we opened up this text, 2 Corinthians, and it says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, what Paul is saying in this is gospel driven. In other words, any kind of worldview that's not Christ, any kind of religious path that's not Christ, any kind of way to peace with God that's not Jesus. We want to take that way and reshape it into the way of Jesus. But there's also the practical day-by-day -day life 
application of the same idea that every thought that goes into your garden, you have the ability as the gardener of that gardener, garden under the power of the spirit of God in the name of Jesus to take the thought that's trying to take root in your garden and to take it captive to the obedience of Christ. Last week we said, well, how do you do that? Well, you start by asking some questions. You don't just sit by passively and say, well, there's some seeds that just got put in my garden or there's a plant that's been in my garden for a while or, you know, my mom had that plant in her garden and her mom had that plant in her garden. Look what, I've got that plant in my garden. It says, no, you activate and you activate by investigating and interrogating the process and you ask questions like, where did that thought come from? In other words, I just woke up. A thought is already in my mind before I start my day. I don't just host that thought and give it sustenance and shelter for the day. I investigate that thought and I say, where did that thought come from? Second question I ask is, is it congruent to the word of God? And if it's not congruent to the word of God, and I know because of the character of my God, it didn't come from my father, then I need now to take the word of God, which is the renewing part of that equation. And I need to wrap that thought up with the renewing power of the truth of God's word and take that thought captive to Christ. And this is the possibility of good gardening. <laughs> This is the possibility of you planting what you want to see in your life. We know that whatever you sow, can you finish that verse? What? Right. You reap. This is what scripture tells us. We reap what we sow. You don't reap what you hope for. You don't reap what you dream about. You, you reap what you actually plant and that works the same way in our minds. And we talk about those principles of sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow, you reap more than you sow, you reap later than you sow. So if you don't garden well and you let a thought that did not come from your father and is not congruent to his word, you let that thought root in your mind, you're gonna get more of that and you're gonna get the same as that and you're gonna get a whole lot of that in a season further down the road than you ever imagined. And so today he's saying garden well. I was thinking about Jeremiah the prophet and even at his inception and conception, God had a plan for his life. I wonder if uh, we believe that today. It's coming in just a moment in the message, but at his inception and conception, God already had a plan for the prophet Jeremiah. And part of the way he describes that is in verse nine. He said, and then the Lord reached out his hand and he touched my mouth and he said to me, now I have put words in your mouth. See today, I appoint you over nations and kingdoms, catch the phrases here, to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The first word is to uproot. The last word in this phrase is to plant. I want us to focus on those two words because that's what gardening is all about, uprooting and planting. You've heard in the gathering already about Love Atlanta, projects going on all over the city. Last year, our project in part was to replant a garden at a transitional uh, center for people who are stepping up and out of poverty. And so what we didn't do was just show up to this area about the size of this part of the platform and just start planting good things into the garden. First, our team had to get everything that was in the garden out of the garden. We had to rake out and we had to turn upside down and we had to till and we had to prepare. And then once all of that was done, then we could begin to put into the garden the things that we were now hoping for into the future season. And it's the same way with our thoughts. And it's what Jeremiah was saying his words were gonna do. And it's what God's word does in our life today. God's word doesn't just put good things into your life. God's word has the power to jettison the things you don't want out of your life, to uproot and to plant. And this is what God 
is thinking about for you. So I want to give us a few things today that you have to start planting. And as you plant them, they're going to begin to uproot the opposite, if that is in fact already in your garden. But planting these supernatural thoughts, and you say, well, what do you mean supernatural thoughts? Are they like some kind of special thoughts that only a few people can know? No, everyone who comes in contact with Almighty God through Christ and opens up his word by the Spirit can know these thoughts. But these are not ordinary, regular, run-of-the-mill, oh, I was just thinking today kind of thoughts. These are God-powered, supernatural ideas. They're transactional and transformative They can take something that is dead and make it alive, take something that is broken and make it whole. These thoughts have within them woven into their very DNA, the power of Almighty God. And they're not going to be that revolutionary. I I don't know. If if you're new to faith and new to Jesus, you might be going, "I, I don't even know. I've never heard this before. But the greater possibility is that you've been around faith and around God and around church and around worship all of your life, but you still don't have a well-cultivated garden of thinking. And today God is saying, let's turn that story around today. In fact, let's start with you believing that you can take control of what you think about and that you're not just a, a person standing by the wayside as your thought life is developed, but you actually have the ability to control the playlist of your thoughts. What would you plant if you had the opportunity to make sure I want to think about this? Now, I have all these random thoughts, right? Like they pop into my head all the time. I don't know where they come from. Some of them are weird and some of them are random and some of them I'm like, oh, I don't know. Why would I think about something like that? So the enemy, he's got thoughts coming in. People are putting thoughts in. You can't look at your screen without all these thoughts coming in. But what are you intentionally planting in the garden of your mind? And if you'll plant these things and give them time to take root, if you will stay with them and cultivate them, God will promise you today that you will see a different you in the season to come. And the first thing is this. The first of these supernatural thoughts is, I am in God's story. You have to plant that thought in your mind. And the reason you have to plant that thought in your mind is it is not natural for a human being who has fallen to have that thought. So you have to let God by the Spirit awaken supernaturally this new idea to you, I am in God's story. And you've got to plant that thought daily, maybe hourly for a season until it takes root in your life and begins to produce fruit in your life that you are in fact in God's story. That you go back often to this phrase, in the beginning, God. In other words, it didn't start with me. I'm not the one who is instigating anything. I am in a story that began with God and that's my reference point for life. In other words, I don't, a friend of mine said this the other day, I wish I could take credit for it, but he said so many people sitting in church, I feel like this is just a reference point for them. Like, I, oh, I need to find something. Oh, I know, there's something over here. Oh, there it is. That, that, that's my reference point for this particular question that I'm asking or this p- particular situation that I'm in uh, or this particular need that I have. I just, I needed a reference point. It's kind of like Google on spiritual terms. And this was a reference point for me more than this is a global lens through which I see everything, including me. I am in God's story. I don't know if you remember way back in the day, but we used to, a lot of us go to something called a mall. And a mall was a collection of stores of all different varieties, all located in one place, some indoor, some outdoor, depending on what part of the world you're in, some small, some enormously large. And what would happen invariably is you were looking for a particular store among hundreds of stores. And so randomly throughout the mall, it was a 
diagram in a directory of the mall that you were in and you looked at it and it didn't make much sense until you found the thing that said what? You are here. <laughs> and once you knew what you were here, you could sort of work your way up the 200s and then they turned green at the 300s and then you knew the upper level was the yellow 400s and then you knew, okay, I need to generally go this way to start working my way towards the destination I want to end up at. You had to figure out at some point, where am I? And this is a way of thought that produces an attitude and a spirit of life. It's, it's opening up this word and realizing as you do, I am here. This is my location based on my relationship with Christ, what Christ has done for me, how God has uniquely wired me and set me in motion. And this is my starting point for life. We talked about it way back in the day in the indescribable talk, but we were talking about trying to get our heads around the Milky Way galaxy and around our solar system. You know, we used to go all the way out to Pluto. Uh, I don't know, think Pluto counts anymore, but just imagine the solar system that we live in, planet Earth revolving around our one star, the sun. And the illustration was given in reference to the Milky Way galaxy and its size, our solar system would be like the size of a quarter in an area as big as the North American continent. So that's the solar system. And North America is the Milky Way, one of hundreds of billions of other galaxies in the world. And that's where we are, somewhere down in there, somewhere on a, a little speck of dust, somewhere among the seven and a half billion people. That's us, that's our reference point. And unless we have that, we're gonna miss out, I believe, on everything in life. Unless we plant the first thought, which is, I am in God's story. The story is not about me, but I have been graciously invited in and almost like given a front row seat to be included in the story of God. So like a few years ago, Shelly and I got invited to a live television show. One of the, probably was the most watched show in, in America at the time, um, an entertainment show. And we were invited by the executive producer and his wife to come and be at the finale of this show. And so there we are. It's pretty great to be in that space. And when it was over, people were like, well, how was it? We were like, man, it was so great. So amazing. We had such a great time. I, we were not in it. We were not contestants. We were never on television. No one knew our name. No one really actually even knew we were there. But it was an incredible experience because we had been invited in to that moment by the person who was co-creating that moment to enjoy that moment. And that's what life is. We've been invited by Almighty God into a story that he has set in motion to come with him into his story to appreciate and enjoy and even be included in what he is doing and to have the opportunity to do what we did that night, which was to go to dinner with the co-creator of this thing and have an actual relationship to think that you are in a story of God that is not about you, but you're not sad about that because you get to have dinner with God every night. The one who's creating the grand story of the universe that you are in. Plant that thought. I am in God's story. The second thought, we'll move kind of quickly, is this thought, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You've got to plant that thought. 
You're like, well, where, I, where do you get a thought like that? I, I didn't get that from my background. I didn't get that from my parents. I didn't get that from myself. And culture's not necessarily telling me that every single day. You get that from the word of God, the word that uproots and the word that plants. And that word tells you, let me let you know, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139, verse 14. Think about the juxtaposition, juxtaposition of those two words. You're fearfully made. We, we don't even know how to use that word in, in a relative sentence. What does it mean? It means when you think about you from the perspective of the creator, it's jaw dropping. It's awe inspiring. It's beyond our ability to even breathe it in. And it makes something inside of us shudder with a sense of the otherness of God. You are fearfully made. Oh, and at the same time, wonderfully made. The wonderfully word has at its root specifically made. In other words, not like the galaxies and not like the quasars and not like the ocean's breadth, you are made more distinctly than that. And we know that the part of us that is made more distinctly than that and why we are jaw-dropping, awe-inspiring, make you tremble on the inside made and uniquely and specifically and distinctly made is because we're made in the image of God. We are image bearers of the divine. That God Almighty, when he made you, made you with a reflection of his image in you. You didn't make God in your image. He made you in his image. And you've got to plant that thought in your mind from his word and let it take root and be cultivated so that you'll wake up every day and go, I know one thing that's true about me. I'm jaw dropping, heart trembling created and I am distinctly a reflection uh, and an image bearer of the almighty God and nothing in all of creation can say that. That's who I am. And that thought, that thought is going to jettison some of the destructive noise that the enemy has tried to put in your mind. That is going to bring you a harvest in days to come that is nothing but destruction and lies. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The third thought, my life has purpose. I mean, you, you would think that we're past that, right? I mean, we're grown, a lot of us that are at church today. You would think I'm beyond that. I've somehow moved down the road from that. Of course, I have purpose. I work at XYZ Company, or I am a parent of XYZ children, or I sit on the board of this and that organization. Of course, I have purpose. I'm, I'm a cog in the wheel, but that's not the kind of purpose we're talking about. We're talking about the purpose that goes back to the last word in that sentence, I I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Made things have purpose. Made things imply a maker. And when you imply a maker, you imply that there was a reason why I set the process in motion uh, to deliver the result of the thing that I have created. And so as we began to back up into the truth of who God is and to plant correctly into our minds. I have a purpose. My life matters and has purpose. We know this because we are made. And we understand, as we've said many times at Passion City Church, I am not random. I am not accidental. I am not 
incidental and I'm not expendable. I am fearfully and wonderfully made, which means there is an assignment for me on planet Earth and a reason for me to breathe the air of God's creation. And there is a lane for me to run in and something for me to do. There is a cause for which I was born. And there is something noble about my contribution to this planet called Earth. I have a purpose. We know that that purpose is wrapped in, 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 in the Imago Dei. If I bear his image, then my purpose must be connected to reflecting his glory. And so for the good of people, for that greater common good and for the glory of God, I'm going to find my lane and I'm going to live my life like it matters because I know that I have purpose. I'm planting that thought in my garden and I am tilling it and watering it and cultivating it and let God expound on it. I'm letting the word reinforce it. I am letting the word completely and utterly transform and do a metamorphosis in my thinking so that I do not think like the pattern of the world, but I now am transformed with a renewed mind that I can prove what the will of God is, that it's good and perfect and pleasing, this will of God, and that I can move forward in the life that he's dreaming about for me. The fourth thought I want to encourage us to plant in the garden of our minds is this thought, the cross has the final word. I, I want you to say it with me. I don't know where you are right now. If you're sitting out in public somewhere, just let people think you're crazy. Um, I want you to say that with me right now. The cross has the final word. You've got to plant that thought in your mind. Because when you plant that thought in your mind, you will be agreeing with God's declaration of victory over your life. That's where the victory was won in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That is the victory. And so without planting that thought in your mind and letting it take root, that the cross has the final word, you're, you, you may circle around the airport called victory, but you're never gonna land the plane. You're never going to pull up to the gate. You're never going to get out and walk in the fullness and the freedom of what God has done for you. The cross has the final word. It has the final word about God and it has the final word about you. See, the first word about God that we see in scripture was got, what got planted in the minds in literally the garden of Eden. And Adam and Eve, literally in the garden, got planted in the garden of their minds. God isn't good and God isn't trustworthy and God doesn't want to give you the best. But the cross got the final word. God is good and God is trustworthy. And left with the option of living without you or living with you, he'll come for you not to get something from you, but to give everything to you. So the cross has the final word about God, but it also has the final word about you, that you are a person of great worth to God. Greater love has no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friend. This is Paul setting up in Romans chapter five, this reality, that this is how God demonstrates his love for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, the cross is followed by nothing. Jesus has the final say, and he speaks to who you are, how God feels about you. He speaks to how you move through, understand that I'm fallen and broken and I don't know how to put everything back together. He speaks to the pathway to forgiveness, to the pathway to mercy. And he speaks to you today and tells you how much God cares about you, how much he loves you and how much he longs for you. You know, I believe 
that you would probably agree with me that the vast majority of destructive seeds of thought and thinking that are planted into our minds could be captured in the categories of unlovely, unwanted, and worthless. I mean, is there a thought in your life that is springing up? Has something taken root in your life that you just can't seem to to get it out of the equation, but when you trace it back through circumstance, situation, relationships, season of life, it traces back to just not good enough. It traces back to just not lovely enough, not wanted enough, not worthy enough. The seed was planted, nothing jettisoned and uprooted it. It's like an oak now in the middle of your thinking. And though there are little plants around it and some pansies have been planted on the side and some begonias over here, the oak in the middle that's still hogging all the nourishment and dictating the narrative is just wasn't good enough just didn't matter enough, just didn't measure up enough to them or to God. And he's saying, no, you need to plant a new thought in your garden today. And here's the thought, the cross gets the final word. The cross gets to define your worth once and for all. Nurture that thought, till that ground, water that reality and let it grow up in your mind until it is the structure by which you organize every other thought in your life. A couple more quickly. Number five, and you've got to plant this thought. What a thought though. I serve at the pleasure of the king. Kind of weird weird language, I know. Unless you've watched a lot of political dramas on Netflix or TV in your life, and you know that phrase pops up occasionally, I serve at the pleasure of the queen, or I serve at the pleasure of the president, or I serve at the pleasure of this position. But this is me, and this is you, because that transformational work of the cross put us in a whole new story. Around Passion City Church, we've got this in the rebar, in the cement foundation of everything we are as a people, that we're a chosen race, we're a royal priesthood, we're a holy nation, and we're a people for God's own possession coming out of Peter. And then that next phrase says, so that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. I want you to plant in your mind when you wake up in the morning and lay down at night, I serve at the pleasure of the king. That's what his grace did for me, brought me from death to life. And you know what I do now? I serve at the pleasure of the king. That's what his grace did for me, got me out of my grave and into brand new life. And you know what I do with the brand new life? I serve at the pleasure of the king. The way I say for me is like this. I am dispatched by the spirit on kingdom assignments to be light in a darkened world so that others can see Jesus. That's my day today. And that's going to be my day tomorrow. I'm planting that thought in the garden of my mind. And that's how I'm going to win the battle of my thoughts. Because I am not going to be perplexed or disappointed when circumstances and situations don't turn out the way that I thought, because no one can stop me today from serving at the pleasure of the King today. Two more quickly. You got to plant this thought in your mind. Number six. I love it. (laughs) Jesus is Lord. Is that thought in your garden, by the way? (laughs) We know through the text that Jesus is God. We know in 2 Corinthians 4 that we've seen 
the light of the glory of God, the one who spoke the light into existence in the face of Christ. So that we know that yes, there's a Trinity, but in that Trinity, Jesus is the incarnation revelation of God in human flesh. And he is the full revelation of what God is like. So much so that we see the glory of God on the very face of Christ. So we know Jesus is God, but there's something else that you need to know about Jesus. And it is that he is Lord. So Paul wrote, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess of those who are in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. They will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In other words, what we've got to plant in our garden today is that the king that we serve at the pleasure of is sitting on a throne. He doesn't take sides. He sits on a throne. And that throne is unrivaled in time and in space and eternity. It makes me think about the announcement of the coming one who would lead the way to Jesus. And when the announcement came through the angel Gabriel in Luke's gospel, chapter one, he shows up to a man who has no kids and a wife who is advanced and aged. And he says, I've come with a message for you. And the message, listen to his message. It's a stunning message. He says, I heard your prayer. Your wife's going to have a son. He will be a joy and a delight. Many will rejoice because of him. He'll be great in the sight of the Lord. He'll be filled with the spirit of God, even from birth. Many will he bring back. He'll come in the power of Elijah. He'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. I heard your prayer. Your wife's going to have a son. He's going to be a joy and a delight. And here is the legacy of his life for the future generations. And do you know what was said back to the angel? How can I be sure? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. But what had Gabriel said? He said, I am Gabriel. Please don't miss this. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you this good news. Now, please understand, I'm not saying that I'm Gabriel the angel or you're Gabriel the angel. I'm just saying that we have access to the throne of God by the person of Christ, that we can come directly to the throne of grace and find mercy and grace in time of need. Not standing in that place with full knowledge, understanding and insight and vision like Gabriel would, but we can come near to the throne of God. We can come like a sparrow who would build a nest right up near the altar of God, Psalm 84. We can come and know this God who is the creator of everything that exists. And then we can move at his pleasure from those places into whatever places we go in. Almost saying like Gabriel, Gabriel, I know God. I know who he is. I know where he sits. I know what his throne is like. I know how glorious he is. I know how unrivaled he is. I know how powerful he is. I know that he isn't taking sides. He is taking over. He is sitting on a throne of thrones. And at the end of the day, every knee bows, every tongue confesses, everyone in alignment says, it is so Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I'm coming to and fro from his throne with kingdom assignments for his people. Zechariah had already planted in his mind, it's never going to happen. So even when Gabriel showed up to plan a new thought. He said, I don't know. How can I know? I'm sorry. I've already planted. We already planted. No sun, no joy, no delight, no great in the sight of the Lord, no filled with the spirit, no setting the captives free. We've already planted. I'm sorry. We've already planted. I don't know. Who are you? We, we, we've already planted. Our garden is full. And God is saying, please, 
Let the word that comes from the presence of God break in to your story today and plant what God says. Even if it 1,000% contradicts everything else that's been spoken, plant what God says in the mind that he has given you stewardship over to garden. Jesus is Lord. Wake up with it. Jesus is Lord. My God is on a throne. His kingdom is forever. And his plans are unassailable and sure. And the last thought, the seventh one, just tucks right next to it. My God turns evil into good. Plan it. Plan it. Why? Because there's going to be evil. Plant it. Why? Because it's not always going to work out exactly the way you thought. Plan it. Why? Because there's going to be times where circumstances contradict it. Plan it. Why? Because we're on a broken planet. So plan it. Because we're on a broken planet. Plant this. God turns evil into good. So I'm waking up into a new day. What am I waking up with? I am in the story of God. And here's who's in the story of God. Someone who's fearfully and wonderfully made. I have a purpose and the cross gets the final word. I serve. Thank you. Not in that job, that job, that office, that cubicle, that station. I serve at the pleasure of the king. And the king I serve, his name is Jesus, and he is Lord. And I'm confident today, whichever way the wind blows, my God is going to turn evil into good. That's up to you now. God said it. Would you plant it? God has declared it. It's up to you to plant it. God has done everything he can to reveal it. It's up to you now to get in it and to plant it and to keep plant it and to keep tilling it and to keep watering it and to keep nurturing it until when? Till like tomorrow, 5.30? No, because you're not getting a crop at 5.30 tomorrow. You might not have even started getting the roots out that have been killing you by 5.30 tomorrow but you keep planning it and you come back next year and you tell Passion City Church, you tell your family of faith and a year from now, look what God has done. My garden is bearing a brand new crop for his glory. Amen. Amen. Victory is what God has in mind for you right now as you let his word uproot and plant and lead you into a brand new future.